Recording in progress. Okay, welcome. Uh, today, it's still the 21st of January for me. I'm trying to get through these lectures to make sure y'all have this during the strike. Um, today's lecture will be on city training and ethics. Uh, I'm gonna go ahead and share a screen. <clears throat> Okay, so lecture three, city training and ethics. Okay, why city training and what is ethics? Well, what is ethics? Ethics and ethnography encompasses a range of principles focused on respect, non-harm, consent, and cultural sensitivity. Why is it important? Well, ethics in suit ensures that research is carried out responsibly, respectfully, and with deep awareness of the complexities involved in studying human societies. What is city training? City training is a program providing comprehensive education in research ethics and compliance, widely used by researchers and institutions to ensure responsible conduct in various fields, including social sciences, biomedical research, and institutional review process aka cover the institution's butt, right? And then the photo in the background is uh, Socrates. <laughs> My mind is not the best today. Um, understanding research, ethics, and anthropology and ethnography. Ethics is a branch of philosophy that involves system systematizing, defending, and recommending concepts of right and wrong behavior. The term comes from the Greek word ethos, which means character or custom. Ethics seeks to answer fundamental questions about the moral values and standards by which human actions can be judged. Research ethics and anthropology and ethnography refers to the set of principles and standards that guide researchers in conducting studies responsibly, ensuring the dignity, rights, and welfare of the participants and the communities they study. Safeguarding participants, ethical guidelines are crucial in protecting the privacy, safety, and emotional well-being of participants, especially in studies that delve into sensitive cultural practices and personal experiences. Maintaining integrity, adhering to ethical standards, ensures the integrity and credibility of the research. Ethical research garners trust and respect from both the academic community and the study's participants. Cultural sensitivity. In anthropology and ethnography, where researchers engage with diverse cultures, ethics guide the respectful and accurate representation of these cultures, avoiding misinterpretation or harm. And the photo on the back is of two people talking. Key ethical principles. You have two uh, images on this slide. One is informed consent and one is respect. So what is an informed consent? Well, informed consent ensures that participants are fully informed about the nature, purpose, and potential impacts of the research and that they are voluntarily agree to participate. Not to mention that people can always take away their consent at any time. Uh, confidentiality and anonymity, protecting the identity and privacy of participants, especially in studies involving sensitive data, non-malfeasance, a commitment, to avoid harm to participants. This includes considering the potential risks of the research and taking steps to mitigate them. Benefits, ensuring that the research provides benefits, whether to the participants, community, or broader field of study, and that these benefits outweigh any risk. Respect for cultural differences, approaching cultural practices and beliefs with respect and sensitivity and acknowledging the researcher's own biases, accountability and transparency, being transparent about the research goals, methodologies, and findings, and account and accountable for the study's ethical conduct. Reflexivity: the researcher should continuously reflect on their role and potential biases, and how these might affect the research process and interpretation. So, bottom line, you can't walk up to somebody and say, "Hey, I have this research project. Do you want to do it?" Right? I mean, you can walk up and say that, but you also need to get consent. You need to tell them what it's about. You can't lie to them what the project's about. Like, I mean, some people have done that in the past, which is why we're here now. Um, and so we have to be able to tell people what we're writing about, what we're doing, right? The role of the Institutional Review Board, you'll be doing a mock IRB later on down the line. Um, but sometime in your career, you may actually do an IRB. So the IRB, is ethical review and approval. 
IRB plays a critical role in reviewing research proposals to ensure they meet ethical standards. This includes assessing how researchers, researchers plan to address issues such as informed consent, confidentiality, and potential risk to participants, protecting participants. Uh, primary goal of the IRB is to protect the rights and welfare of research participants. This is particularly important in ethnographic research where subjects might be vulnerable due to factors such as socioeconomic status, cultural marginalization, and political context, monitoring research conduct. The IRB also monitors the conduct of approved research projects to ensure ongoing compliance with ethical standards. Researchers may need to report back to the IRB, especially if there are changes in the research protocol or unforeseen issues arise. Providing guidance. IRBs offer guidance to researchers, helping them navigate complex ethical issues and enhance the ethical quality of their research. So bottom line, if you come up to a morally gray area in your research and you're not sure if it's good or not, or if it can be done under the auspices of your IRB, call them email them. They're actually very helpful, very responsive. They can only get back to you within like 48 hours or less. Um, and they're pretty good about helping you figure out what you can and can't do if, if the need arises. <clears throat> informed consent and ethnography. So informed consent, as we went over before, is a process of obtaining voluntary agreement from research participants after they've been fully informed, fully informed, about the study's purpose, procedures, risks, and benefits. Importance, it is foundational ethical principle ensuring respect for the autonomy and dignity of participants. It's crucial for building trust and credibility in ethnographic research. In field work, consent is key to ethical research practices, safeguarding participants' rights and well-being, cultural sensitivity and ethnography where researchers engage with diverse cultures, understanding and respecting local norms around consent is vital. So there's different ways to obtain informed consent. Um, the like you could get it, you know, recorded, right? Um, either through video or audio. But honestly, I feel the best is to get written consent. Uh, it really covers not just you, not just the institution, but also the person, so they can go back and look and make sure that it's on the up and up, and you're doing what you said you're going to do, and vice versa. Um, but there's also a language that goes with that informed consent too when you write it out. Uh, and it typically has to be uh, a rule of thumb is below an eighth grade, re like eight US eighth grade reading level is typically how you want to write it. So it shouldn't be in like academic jargon or anything like that. Um, obtaining informed consent in different cultural contexts, communication methods, tailor communication methods to culturally appropriate ensuring participants fully understand the research. This might involve using local languages, metaphors, and symbols. So that's where, you know, learning the other language comes in. Also having an interpreter that could help. Uh, community involvement. In some cultures, it may be necessary to obtain consent from community leaders or elders before approaching individuals. That happens too. Um, even working in the U.S. where I work, I seek out community leaders first before I start just delving right in because, um, it's good to have that community construct there and to help build those relationships. Literacy considerations, like I said before, you have to remember the rule of thumb is typically eighth grade, US eighth grade level. <clears throat> In context with low literacy, researchers should use oral consent processes, often supplemented with local interpreters. Continuous process, recognize that informed consent is an ongoing process, not a one-time event. Researchers should check in regularly with participants to ensure their continued consent. So, for instance, if you interview one person once, you're interviewing them again, you should, you know, make sure to re reiterate the consent is good to go and, you know, everything is on the up and up. Documentation while writing consent is standard. In some cultural contexts, alternative forms of documenting consent, such as audio and video recordings, may be more appropriate. Sensitivity to power dynamics, be aware of power imbalances and ensure that consent is given freely and without coercion. Confidentiality and anonymity in ethnography. Ensuring participant confidentiality. This is also a very important part. And this is something that the Iron Ireland went over quite a bit. So I hope you read it. Uh, definition of importance. Confidentiality involves protecting the personal information of research participants from unauthorized disclosure. It's vital for maintaining trust and safeguarding participants' privacy and safety. Data handling. Implement secure data storage and handling practices. This includes using encrypted digital files, secure databases, eliminating access to sensitive information. The IRB will harp on you about this. Uh, 
anonymization of data, replace names and identifiable details with pseudonyms or codes in research records and publications to protect participant identities. Careful reporting. When reporting findings, ensure the data is presented in a way that participants cannot be directly or indirectly identified, especially in a small or closely knit communities, which is what happened in, the, in you know, saying scholars and schizophrenics. People were able to identify people and it had real world ramifications. Um, so sometimes that's not always the best. Sometimes you have to create like an amalgamation or like a conglomeration of identities. Um, but if you do that, you need to make sure that you're saying that you're doing that as well. Uh, maintaining anonymity, anonymity versus confidentiality. While confidentiality refers to not disclosing identifiable information outside this, the research team, anonymity means keeping participants' identities unknown even to the researchers, if that's something going on and something you need to do. Techniques for anonymity. In some studies, it may be necessary to collect data without reporting identifiable information or to use methods that ensure the researcher cannot link responses to, indiv to individual participants. So that's if that's depending on how it goes with really how sensitive information you have. Um, and it's your job as a researcher to protect your co-producers. Some people like to say interlocutors. Some people like to say collaborators. I prefer to say co-producers because we're co-producing knowledge together. Um, the image in the background is a top secret, right? And that's because when, you know, you might be on a research team, you don't want, like, you're protecting these people's identity, even to the other researchers. So you may be giving them a pseudonym or something else to protect them and protect the data, right? And other identifiable qualities, because that's part of your job as a researcher, right? When it comes down to other people in your team. Confidentiality and anonymity and ethnography have continued implications of breaking confidentiality. Well, because there's lots of trust ethical and legal consequences, and risk of harm, right? So confidential to be open by addressee only. Cultural sensitivity and respect in ethnography, uh, importance of cultural sensitivity, respecting cultural uh, culture and norms, recognizing and respecting the unique customs, traditions, and values of the community being studied is vital. Cultural sensitivity is key to gaining meaningful insights and avoiding misunderstandings. Building trust, respectful engagement with the community fosters trust, which is essential for the depth and authenticity of ethnographic research. Strategies for cultural sensitivity. Active learning. Take the time to learn about the culture, history, and social norms of the community. This involves both pre-research prep and continuous learning during field work. Engagement with community. Interact with community members in a respectful manner, showing openness to their perspectives and experiences. Use of language. Be mindful of language use. Employing local languages or dialects where possible can demonstrate respect and facilitate better understanding and adapting research methods. Modify research methods to culturally appropriate and sensitive to local context. So, you know, if, if you're in an area that uh, requires you to be culturally sensitive, well, you should be culturally sensitive. I mean, that's some of, some of the things that you got to think about as a lot of us are Westerners, right? We go into an area that violates their cultural norms we may be punished for that. And that's something that we have to think about. And that's not just punishment in terms of being physically, emotionally, mentally, or some sort of imprisonment. It could also be losing those contacts, right? Because you're in their house. And that's something that oftentimes Westerners are looked at as being very bad about is that we, you know, look at, oftentimes Westerners look at things like, well, if it's not up to the Western standard, then they're primitive or they're, you know, um, not civilized or something along those lines. But we're ethnographers, we're anthropologists, you know, we're social scientists. Our job is not to look down on people for having a different way of life. Our job is to understand that different way of life, right? And not to pass judgment on it. Avoiding ethnocentrism, like we just talked about, definition of anthrocentrism, for those of you who don't know, is the act of judging another culture solely by the values and standards of one's own culture. It can lead to biased interpretations and misunderstandings, promoting cultural relativism, which we talked in the second lecture, approach research from a standpoint of cultural relativism, which involves understanding and interpreting behaviors and beliefs within their cultural context without imposing one's own cultural standards. Cultural relativism, respecting difference. Acknowledge that cultural practices and beliefs are diverse and relative. What is considered normal in one culture may be different in another. 
avoid judgment. Avoid making judgments based on one's own cultural standards. Instead, strive to understand the culture from the perspective of, of its members. Navigating ethical dilemmas and ethnography. Identifying politic, potential ethical dilemmas. Cultural misunderstanding. Situations where cultural norms of the study group conflict with ethical standards or expectations of the research community. Consent complexity. Challenges in obtaining truly informed consent due to language barriers, literacy levels, or differing, differing cultural understanding of consent. Confidentiality versus disclosure. Dilemmas involving situations where maintaining confidentiality might conflict with legal or moral obligations to disclose information, such as reporting harm. Uh, intervention decisions. Deciding whether to intervene in harmful or dangerous situations observed during career work. Balancing the role as a researcher and ethical responsibilities. I mean, honestly, for me, when it comes down to something, if I see something that's going on, um, and it's difficult, right? I, I always like to think of it as this. If it's something you can walk away from and something you can live with, then walk away from it. If it's something that you can't, then you should say something or do something, right? It's... It's definitely a really screwed area. I definitely feel the IRB may tell you to keep out of it, right? Kind of like the nature of photographers uh, that, you know, they'll watch the baby bird or whatever get eaten because it's just the way nature works. It works as observers, right? But I don't agree with that. Um, you know, it, it's one of those things where if I, think so, if I see something going on that's wrong, then, you know, I may step in. You know, but I also have to be able to think about, is this something I can walk away from? Is this something that is something that will cause me a moral injury if I don't intervene? That's something you have to think about yourself, you know, uh, and something to weigh on your own thoughts and your minds and your conscience. Approaches to resolving ethical conflict. Reflexivity and awareness. Continually reflect on your role and potential biases. Being aware of how your actions and decisions impact community and your research. Seeking guidance. Consult with colleagues, mentors, or an ethics review board when faced with difficult ethical decisions. Peer review can provide valuable insights and diverse, diverse perspectives. Cultural consultation. Engage with cultural experts or community leaders to understand the best course of action in a culturally sensitive context. Adapting to research practices, be prepared to adapt research methods and, and practices in response to ethical challenges encountered in the field. Documenting and reporting, keep thorough documentation of how ethical dilemmas were approached and resolved. The transparency is crucial for ethical accountability and contributions to the broader field of ethnographic ethics. Ethics as an ongoing process. Recognize that ethics is not a one-time consideration, but an ongoing process throughout the research life cycle. So that's something that you will be keeping account of in your notes, in your field notes, you should keep an account of the things that happen, right? But then also, if something does happen, you know, let's say you intervene in something, you need to mark that in your IRB, you put it in your report, right? That's something we'll go over later, but it's basically a little tab that you hit that you're reporting that something happened, right? Um, and then the image is, looks like a ship that's floating through small little chunks of ice somewhere in maybe the Arctic Sea. Uh, case study and examples in ethnographic studies, or excuse me, ethnographic ethics. Uh, the image says case file behind it, has a gavel and glasses and a pen. Introduction to case studies, real world application. Presenting case studies that exemplify common ethical challenges faced in ethnographic research. These cases provide insights into practical applications of ethical principles. Case study one, informed consent in indigenous communities. Challenge, navigating informed consent in a community with collective decision-making practices. Best practice response, working with community leaders to facilitate a group consent process while also ensuring individual understanding and agreement. And that's been used, uh, having a large group consent is good, but there's been times that abbreviations or like hybrids of this have been used against indigenous communities. Uh, for instance, for those of you who are familiar with the Bay Area, right, the San Francisco Bay Area, you have uh, the IKEA, right, Show Mountain Drive. So Show Mountain Drive is a big thing down here for archaeologists and anthropologists because in a lot of ways, um, that consent was used against the tribe, right, the, the folks who were there or the, uh, the properties owned by 
at the time. And so what happened was the developers went and they had kind of like a hybrid thing of consent where they didn't need everybody to approve, just like one or two people to approve. And they were able to go find one or two people who were willing to sign on the dotted line that were members of the tribe and send it to it. And that was it. And uh, they were able to build Shell Mountain Drive and Ikea and all the other stuff out here. So just, just keep in mind that when we're doing that and how that consent is developed, uh, having the community in, as a collective decision-making practice is good, but just remember how in which that's created. Um, case study two, confidentiality in small communities. Maintaining anonymity and confidentiality in a small, tightly knit community where individuals can easily be identified. Best practice response, using composite characters or broadening the context and reporting to protect identities while ensuring the essence of accuracy of the findings are maintained. Well, the Iron Ireland is a good example of this. What do you think? What would you do, right? How would you maintain that anonymity, but then also work with that, work with that group? How would you do that differently than Nancy Shepard Hughes? Case study three, cultural misunderstanding and research bias. A researcher's preconceived notion is leading to misinterpretation of cultural practices, uh, best practice response, engaging in reflexivity, seeking cultural guidance, and being open to adjusting hypotheses and interpretations in light of cultural insights. Uh, so basically, you know, you might go somewhere, you have, because everybody has preconceived notions, right? We have the ideas of how something should be or how something may be. And we get there and it's not like that at all, right? And sometimes that'll force us to rethink uh, and rethink not just our, our hypothesis, but also our own uh, our own thoughts about other people. Uh, case study four, balancing non-intervention and harm prevention. Witnessing harmful practices during field work and grappling with the decisions to intervene or respect cultural autonomy. Best practice response. Weighing in the risk and benefits of intervention, consulting with ethics boards and local authorities, and prioritizing the well-being and rights of individuals. Well, we already went over this, and like I said, that's the textbook definition. But I myself, like I said, it has to be something that you can live with. That's going to be the end of the day with that. Is can you? For those of you that know, don't know, what, like a moral injury is a moral injury is like something that like harms your value or harms you due to like you violating your values in some way or seeing something that violated it in some way, shape or form and not being able to do anything about it. Or maybe you did do something about it and you did the wrong thing. I don't know, I mean, it's up to you. And that's something that you're gonna have to think about. Case study five, data sharing and participant privacy. Citing how to share research data without compromising participant privacy, especially in projects that promise open data. So best practice response is implementing data nominalization techniques, obtaining consent for data sharing, and considering alternative data sharing formats that protect privacy. All right, city training overview for ethnographers. So what is city training? Comprehensive education. City is collaborative institutional training initiative. So do we have it at Berkeley? Yes. Is that Humboldt? Yes. Is that UCLA? Yes. Is that SF State? Yes. Stanford? Yes. So this is something that goes throughout most U.S. universities as far as I know. And uh, when I try to take it for Humboldt, Humboldt, it basically just transferred whatever I had from Berkeley, uh, which we will do a small walkthrough for city training. So don't stress out too much about it. It's not difficult, but you definitely need to uh, pay attention to it. All right. And the training provides comprehensive education on research ethics, responsible conduct of research and compliance. Relevance for ethnographers. Well, for ethnographers, it offers crucial insight into the ethical complexities of working with human subjects, including issues of consent, confidentiality, cultural sensitivity, and IRB process. The importance of city training ethnography. City training helps ethnographers understand and adhere to the ethical standards required in research and ensuring the protection of participants. Building credibility and trust, knowledge gained from city training can enhance the credibility of the researcher and build trust with participants and the academic community. It also provides guidance on handling the unique ethical challenges that arise in ethnographic research. Uh, accessing and completing city training modules. So that's something we're going to do in a minute. Uh, but just remember for the certification, upon completion, researchers receive a certificate, which is often required by institutions for conducting research. Please save a copy for yourself and submit to Canvas. 
Uh, so for training, you follow this link, you just click on it. You're gonna be selecting number one, social and behavioral research investigators, choose the group, blah, blah, blah. You're gonna choose that one. You're going to, for question two, your responsible content of research. Question three, yes. Question four and five, it's not applicable. Six, not at this time. Seven, yes. Eight is optional for you. Uh, so that's the community notes part, but don't worry about that. We're, <clears throat> excuse me, we're exiting out of that because I'm going to uh, stop share. And then I'm going to reshare uh, here at the Institutional Review Board. And then I will share screen again. Excuse me, got a little bit of the hiccups. So we are sharing now. So this is what the humble institutional review board looks like. And caution, the only course that will satisfy the IRB city requirement is the social and behavioral research Basic refresher, basic course. This is true for undergraduate and graduate students because you have to retake it like every two years, okay? So next, we're going to, there's, there's an alternative way, but it shouldn't matter. You should be able to just go to this, okay? Click on the city program. It says log in through my organization. You can also log in here, right? There's like my little username. That's my password. Log in through my organization, which is what you're going to be doing. Okay, you may be having to register. You have to register, you go here, you select your organization affiliation, which will be humble. But okay, so fast forward that. For those of you who have to register, go ahead and pause. Um, so we're gonna go with Cobb Poly Humboldt, Sponsored Programs Foundation. Continue to SSO login instructions. Okay, it will take you there to the, for, for me, it just loaded in. It will probably take you to your login screen. Go ahead and log in. So here you see the stuff. Okay, so Cal Poly Responsible Conduct uh, Research, right? Um, these are all the different ones I had to do with different things, right? So I completed courses. See, I completed the social and behavior refresher. Uh, you're going to take the course, right, after you've already added it going to view it. This is like if you need to get the certificate, you can view print, right? There you go. And you just copy, save, and bada bing, bada boom. That's it. Okay. I'll stop sharing now. And then, so that's how we do the city training, right? Okay, so I had to take a quick break. Uh, now we're going to be moving on to the human subject stuff, right? So this is pretty much like after you've done your city training. And this will be more on like your IRB and things of that nature. So human subjects and research. Uh, based heavily on the slide designed by Dr. Karen Nakamura and Susan Borgi. Uh, so the basics. Well, what's a human subject, right? The human subject is a living individual about whom an investigator obtains data through intervention, interaction, or obtains identifiable personal information. Research, systemic, systematic investigation designed to develop or contribute to general generalizable knowledge. Is anthro research? Yes. Is ethnography research? Yes. The product, you know, and so why is anthropology and ethnography research? Well, it's the production of generalized generalizable knowledge, and we're social science, damn it. Um, no, IRBs are a pain in the buttocks and oral history exemption, right? Um, IRB review is, a, is an objective review by an outside party. We kind of covered a little bit about this, but this will go more in depth. Charge to protect the rights and welfare of research participants and institutional. So as I said before, cover your butt. What led to this? Well, Okay, so here's quite a few things here, and I'll have the slides uploaded so you can take a look. So you can see the different experimentations, the human experimentations that are forced on people. Uh, so some of these are taken during the Holocaust. Some of them are from the syphilis experiments. There's a lot of different things here, uh, you know, that created this, right? And some of them are, are just very disgusting, so to speak, you know? Um, 
So I apologize if I didn't warn you in time, but definitely a trigger warning for some of these. I'll make sure to put that in the uh, in the description. All right, here's a doctor's trial, you know, for, for the Nazis, the doctor's trial for them, the Nuremberg Code. This is what, you know, developed from the Nuremberg Code due to the Nazis. Uh, voluntary and informed consent experiments must be scientifically necessary and conducted by qualified people. Uh, favorable risk benefit analysis benefit the science must be out must be weighed against uh, risks and suffering of human research subjects and the right to withdraw without penalty. Right here's a test D experiment uh, occurred from 1932-1972. For those of you who aren't aware of the test D experiment. Um, you wonder why a lot of folks don't trust the government, especially black and brown folks. Well, here's one key thing here where they infected, you know, hundreds of people with syphilis, specifically black men with syphilis, and then didn't treat them, just kind of observed and saw what the effects of syphilis was, you know, what the effects were on them, on their family members, right? It was, it was really screwed up. Um, <clears throat> It's it's ridiculous, right? You also have the Stanford Prison Experiment. Uh, let's see, look at the video here. Oh my goodness! We don't have At two thirty a.m., the prisoners were rudely awakened from their sleep by the night guard ship where they count. The guard were told to routinely perform counts to familiarize the prisoners with their numbers. Determined that they were all present and accounted for. But more important, it provided a regular occasion for the guards to interact with and exercise control over the prisoners. There were several counts every day were made. So that was just a small video. And if you want to look up more, you can check out the quietrage.org. But there's the Stanford Prison Experiment, which was pretty ridiculous. Um, they were basically it was a study, these people weren't actual prisoners. They were students like yourselves and the guards were students like yourselves. And basically they studied to see what happened. And it was extremely brutal in, in the way in which people were treated. Um, so why should anthropologists care, right? Well, there were requirements of funding and research, history of abuse of ethnographic privilege. Uh, you look at um, Yamanano, the Fierce People, which was uh, Shangon, uh, Napoleon Shangon, that was his work. Two Room Trade, False Representation, right? Same Scholars, Schizophrenics, Deductive Disclosure, right? We talked about this earlier with Nancy Shepard Hughes. Uh, Sambia, rel Relevation of Travel Secrets, right? So these are all things that have happened in the last, well, back then, right? This is from 68 to 87. You know, this is not a wide timeline in anthropology, but these ha things happened, right? Um, and it's ridiculous. And this is one reason why we have the IRB now. Guidance documents, right? So these are some of the guidance documents and you can look them up on your own. Uh, you have the Belmont Report from 79, 45 CFR 46, Federal Rules, Professional Code of Ethics, the American Anthropology Association Code of Ethics, uh, Common Principles, right? Uh, we went over this before, the benefits, the minimize risks, maximize benefits, respect for persons, individual autonomy, justice, equitable distribution of burdens and benefits, uh, benefits, identification of risks, you know, what are the risks? Can risks be reduced further? Do the benefits justify the risks? Are there any individuals who are more susceptible to the risks? And is the research design sound? Well, this leads us to the question, what is risk? Well, risk equals the probability of harm or injury occurring as a result of participation in a research study. Well, what is harm or injury? Well, it could be physical, psychological, criminal, social, or economic. Different levels of risk. Well, minimal risk, you know, we want risk as low as possible. And minimal risk of the probability and magnitude of harm or discomfort anticipated are not greater than those ordinarily encountered in daily life or during routine examinations. That's our goal, right? Risk of harm from disclosure, you have social, legal, psychological, financial risks, 
can the subjects be identified? Will disclosure lead to harm? Inductive disclosure? Medical psychiatric information? Well, you have Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act in 1996. Protection of confidential medical records. This applies to the U.S. and local rules and regulations outside of the U.S. Uh, special concerns and open-ended interviews. Well, in open-ended interviews, sometimes you have unexpected disclosure, illegal activities, uh, right? Things that weren't documented, child abuse, elder abuse, domestic abuse, mandatory reporters vary by state. So, you know, you may or may not be a mandatory reporter depending on where you're at. Risk of self-harm, uh, possibility of intervention, re-traumatization. That's why we have to be careful with our open-ended questions because of what they may lead to. Uh, ways to protect subject privacy. Collect data anonymously whenever possible. Code confidential data and destroy key as soon as possible. Just secure storage of data, collect data in secure location, and certificate of confidentiality. Autonomy and informed consent. Uh, respect for subjects. Are the subjects fully informed? We went over this again, or right? we went over this before, we're going over it again. Are the subjects free to decline without penalty? Duplicity and non-disclosure. The goal is to provide a full description of the study and then allow interested people to decide for themselves. All right, here's informed consent. And the reason I'm harping on this is because it is so important, you know, because consent, we don't just talk about this just in the realm of personal relationships, but in research relationships, it's important as well. Um, basic consent information, keep language simple. Who are you? Why are you here? Right? Statement that this is research, goals of the research, what will it entail, procedures to be used, time commitments that they will have to, you know, people in the study will have to uh, work with, possible risks and benefits. Who's going to know about it? Degree of confidentiality. Do I have to? Participation is voluntary. You can withdraw at any time without penalty. And that's not fair. Well, who's the contact for questions and problems, right? So, so oftentimes it would be like your primary invest, uh, your investigator, uh, which in this case would be me, or if you're working on, uh, let's say you're a master's student or you're working on your honors thesis or something along those lines, it would be your advisor. Uh, waiver of consent documentation. Consent form is only recorded in your study. It'll become from, a, it'll go from a possibly exempt to a non-exempt study. <clears throat> Vulnerable populations are children, prisoners, which include prisoners of war, cognitively impaired people, students, and educationally or economically disadvantaged people. And when some or all the subjects are likely to be vulnerable or coercion or undue influence, such as children, prisoners, pregnant women, mentally disabled persons, or economically or educationally disadvantaged persons, additional safeguards have been included in the study to protect their rights and welfare of these subjects. Moving on to international research, uh, we already talked about this. You have to have uh, sensitivity to local cultures. What are my responsibilities? Well, you must recognize research involving human subjects and submit protocol. Design studies in keeping with ethical guidelines, adhere to protocol or request changes, and notify IRB of any problems. Submit continuing review documents. Types of review. Well, you got full committee review, exemptions, expedited review, continuing review, amendments, and adverse events. Case studies. Uh, these are some more studies if you want to take a look at. The rest of the other ones were pretty just general, uh, generalized. Health is available. Um, this is for the Berkeley one. Uh, you'll have the link.